This is Brian from Breaking Down Security. A couple weeks ago, I attended B-Side Seattle and I had a great time. A lot of great talks there, a lot of great people. Uh, had, you know, filled up a nice little conference area at uh, Microsoft's Redmond campus at the headquarters there. Um, got to got to meet quite a few people, and um, I got to interview some of those people as well. So, one of the people you hear is um, uh, at J Case on uh, on Twitter. J Case uh, gave us a talk about hacking the uh, Google Pixel phones uh, from HTC. Uh, we talked about you know some of the methods by which he does that and some of the mechanisms involved uh, in making sure that you actually get a proper uh, uh, root on your phone or, or hack on your phone. Uh, John Sawyer can be found at, at J Case on Twitter and uh, yeah, I had about a, a nice 10 minute conversation with him. Uh, one of the other things I did there was, um, and from what I understand, it's um, fairly unique. Uh, we had Sam Vaughn on, who is at sidechannel underscore org on Twitter. Uh, he does a crypto village. So we sat down and, uh, and talked about setting up the crypto village, talking about various um, methods of, of implementation and various ciphers. And, and you know, got our, our, our math geek on with regard to, you know, detecting ciphers. I actually got a book. Um, I, I solved some of the level one, enough of the level, enough of the level one uh puzzles that I, I got a book um, which I fully intend to read and uh, and, and maybe use some of that in, uh, in next year's uh, Derbycon CTF if we can uh, if we can swing that so that that was a really great talk on that uh, finally uh, Matt Domko um, came and he was a speaker and he came and talked about using bro to analyze packets he created a script that helps uh, do that uh, he is at hashtag cyber that's the word hashtag he'll explain it, 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 it when we get in there so um yeah so that was uh that was a great time uh definitely uh take the time to find your local b-sides and attend that um some of them are quite small and and intimate others are starting to pick up steam when i went to this one the first time uh, this would be my third one i've been to the first year i think had about 150 people and now uh last year uh last a couple weeks ago, I think they were pushing about 300. So they were pushing about the upper limits of uh, uh, of the the place that they were at. So it's it's really nice to see this uh, uh, get bigger. And then you know we're having people from all over the country come in. We had people. Uh, we had a gentleman from uh, Chicago. Uh, at least the people that I talked to. Uh, you know, Matt was from uh, the Atlanta area. So you know, all people coming from all over the country just to talk at B-Side Seattle. So that's that's really great to see. Um, and tickets are cheap. So, you know, you can't uh, you can't say, well, you know, it's like RSA, a couple thousand dollars to get a ticket. So you can always uh, afford, usually, to get in at, at B-Sides. So, uh, yeah, definitely check out your where your local B-Sides are. There's probably one within 100 miles of you anywhere in, in the U.S., and they're definitely becoming more of a thing overseas. So uh, check those out. Besides, London is coming up soon, uh, from what I from what I remember. So um, you know, if you are in the European area, um, there's at least besides London that I know of, and I'm sure there's others that are being uh, done as well. So uh, before we get to the show, I just wanted to mention uh, you can find uh, myself, Miss Berlin, and Mr. Betcher on Twitter. I'm at Brian Break. Uh, Amanda Amanda Berlin is at Info Sister. That's I N F O S Y S T I R. And of course, Mr. Betcher is always at Betcher Pone. B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. Uh, you can find the official show at Breaksec. B R A K E S E C. And uh, we're we're pretty much everywhere else. We're on Twitter, um, as I mentioned, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube channel, iTunes, Google Play Store. Tell your friends, um, you know, we have an RSS feed and uh, you can also find uh, other links to to our other places where you can find us on, in our show notes at uh, BreakingSecurity.com. Okay. Um, can't think of anything else. Uh, oh, sorry. Comments, questions, or suggestions, just email us, uh, bds.podcast at gmail.com. Okay. Everyone have a great week. See you later. All right, so it's Brian here at B Side Seattle. Um, I'm with the first person of the day. We didn't have a keynote. That was weird. 
keynote's at the end of the day, I think. Oh, they do reverse keynote? Or That's they do what a sign set. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. All right. So um, I'm here with uh, on Twitter. He's at J Case. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to our show. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so you gave a talk on uh, hacking the Google Pixel. Why did Why did you do that? Well, I I like hacking HTC phones. I like Google phones, and I wanted to come to Seattle for sushi, and it's a good excuse. Ah, oh, well, I mean, sh- uh, short of Vancouver, I think, yeah, Seattle's probably a, a good... Cr- You're in Redmond, though. I mean, well, we're, I'm in, I'm in, well, I live in Port Angeles, and we have no... We have one sushi place that's decent. Oh, really? No really good sushi, so... Oh, okay. Any chance I can get to come up here, I can take it for sushi. sushi. Okay. So you, um, you had several slides on there uh, talking about... Uh, you know, what you went through to, to reverse engineer. You said you had boxes of phones. How do you, obviously you're not going to the Verizon store, or the AT&T store, or the Telus store to get your phones. Are you just buying like prepaid cellular phones? Um, about half and half. Really? I buy a lot of prepaid ones because, you know, it's a good thing. If you're in a funk and you're not finding something, it's nice to find something that kind of gives you encouragement. Uh-huh. And the prepaid ones tend to be um, lower quality. So the prepaid uh-huh. ones are easier to find stuff on. So if I'm in a funk, I'll go to Walmart and buy ten of the fifteen twenty dollar phones, oh, wow. and then we'll, you know, I'll find something. And I'm like, oh yeah, now I have some, so I encourage to work further. Okay. And you said you've bricked, you've got like a box of bricked phones. Is there no way to recover those, like using a JTAG or um, something like that? Some of them, yes. Some of them, no. Okay. Okay. Like if you blow the wrong fuses or you screw up flash storage, you know, it's it's a dead phone. Okay. Okay. And um, so you uh, you. You raised quite a bit of money from bug bounty programs, so this was uh, this was a very uh, lucrative year for you. But you you give it all to charity. All the bug bounty funds go to charity. Yeah, that's very cool, yeah. and that was very inspiring. So Thank I you. Appreciate that. It was awesome. Um, <clears throat> so you just have it in for HTC because I, I like HTC. I, I actually like HTC. I don't really have it in for them, but I like it. I like them. I like messing with phones. Yeah. You were telling us a story about how they had... They, you know, they tried to bully me. Not not really HTC, but one of their developers, who I believe made the, the, the mistake yeah. that I exploited once, tried to bully me a little bit. That kind of gave me a little bit of a hard-on for HTC. It was an overreaction on their part? Or they, they didn't I, just, I, I like to blame HTC, like I said, but I think it's just one developer was overreacting. But yeah... It, it was kind of scary. He was calling my house. And he was calling it from a fairly local number. Wow. So it was like, you know, I have small kids. I was freaking out a little bit. But uh, yeah. that was a number of years ago. Um, the HTC security team, however, despite not willing to drink with me, they've always been cordial when I've met them. They're always nice people. So Okay. So we see a lot of stories in the news about how Android devices are insecure and they blame, you know, the handsets for that. You and your talk said that the majority of the security issues are, are OEM based, not necessarily Google based. Yeah, I don't like I don't like when people say Android's insecure. Android has its security problems, but most of the issues that get attention and most of the issues that actually end up existing are not really Android's fault. They fall on some OEM customization or some underlying OEM software. Mm-hmm. Is that so? There's the basic uh, vanilla Android. AOSP, and then it's just the add-ons, the little bits that they think they can just typically, shoehorn yeah. into it. Yeah, typically that's where I'm going to say most, almost, almost all of my vulnerabilities come out of the, the shoehorned OEM customizations or the carrier customizations. Okay, and and you said that the the Pixel phones. Um, I have a Pixel phone. I have a, a, an XL actually. Um, I bought mine from the Google Store, so mine can be unlocked, right? Right. Right. Okay. I, yeah. You said there were only certain phones, certain handsets. Um, I know for sure Verizon and EE UK sold handsets can't be unlocked uh, officially. Yeah. I am told conflicting information on whether the Canadian Telus carrier ones can. Okay. So I'm not 100% positive on those. But. Yeah. So the reason that I actually bought my Pixel phone was because I have a Nexus 6 that I wanted to play. <sighs> People got to get it. I play Pokemon Go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sadly, yes, I play Pokemon Go. My phone was rooted. And because of something called Safety Net, I was unable to use that stuff. Uh, so I had to go legit. Um, I think it's a fairly decent thing, but I mean, um, 
you do, do you deal a lot with those kinds of detections uh, when when you're when you're hacking on a phone? I don't care about it typically. I don't you know I don't my personal phone I don't run rooted, so I don't have an issue, and I I don't really care if they detect it unless it does something negative to the phone's ability to turn on. Yeah. So. So when you're reversing phones, uh, the reason you have a bunch of you know boxes full of bricked phones is because you'll go in and you'll look at something and it'll pop a fuse because you didn't know it was there or some well, kind of technology? So they use fuses for storage of certain phones, like AC, like excuse me, Motorola we use a, a Qualcomm fuse to store whether it can be unlocked or not. Mm -hmm. So you know if you blow the wrong fuses, they can store other information too, but you can blow the wrong fuse, the phone won't turn on anymore. It's not their fault, it's I'm tinkering with it and I did something wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, some phones, if you mess with the flash memory wrong, it'll stop working. Yeah. You know, or sometimes it just breaks, and I don't know why, but it stopped working. So. Yeah. So, um, okay, so I, I'm not exactly certain what a, a fuse is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm it's seeing a fuse. a fuse. It's a fuse. A physical, a physical, a physical fuse. You can just use to store information. Really? Okay. okay. Yeah. It's like a little chip. like a. No, it's a fuse. It's a fuse. Literally a fuse. Okay. So what happens? You you tamper with it. It sends voltage in the wrong area, and that and that fuse breaks. Well, yeah. Sometimes you want to pop the fuse. Okay. Like a Motorola phone, if you pop the fuse, then you can unlock the bootloader. Right. They use a fuse to control whether the consumer can unlock the bootloader or not. Like the Verizon ones, the unlocking fuse is not blown. So if you can find a way to trigger that fuse to blow, then you can all start unlocking the phone. Okay. And you can un you obviously can unblow the fuse. No, you can't. It's a physical fuse. Really? Okay. So if you blow a fuse, it can't be unblown. Wow. All right, because I've I've actually returned some phones back to stock OEM well, it for on selling. The, it depends on the phone and how it's stored. Not all phones use fuses for unlocking. Okay, so you only deal with HTC, but have you dealt with like some of the Samsung oh, stuff, everybody. like Knox or anything like that? Okay, can't talk about that one. All right, anyway, we're gonna move along. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you, uh, so how how do you how do you how do you find your how, how do you continue to hack on these? Um, what's the starting point for something like this? Because in your talk, you firmware. Said, it's always a starting point. Firmware, always. You're dumping. You're dumping the firmware. You either dump it or taint it. I mean, you have to have the firmware. You can't start on it. And that takes a lot of Google dorking, you said. Google dorking is a good way to get firmware. Okay. All right. But so you, because these OEM manufacturers build upon. The previous phone generations, so the HTC nines or the you know the whatevers, they just use the same code base. On, sometimes, on multiple, on, sometimes, sometimes they restart. HTC restarted with the nine. They restarted everything. They rebased really? all of it. Well, almost all of it. Okay. Okay. So, so totally, entirely new code base. So you had to basically learn from scratch day one. I mean, it wasn't day. entirely new, but it was mostly new. It was okay. different. Okay. Because so. different architecture, different technology, different. Yeah, yeah, they moved. Yeah. Different it's sockets different. and stuff. Different socket on. I have no idea what they did really, but right. they moved to it. Like it used to be just the bootloaders, and you'd flash the firmware in the LK bootloader. Now you flash the firmware in the download mode, which is not a bootloader; it's an actual kernel Linux kernel on RAM disk. Yeah. Okay. So. So you use a lot of specialized tools. Uh, you mentioned IDA in your talk. You actually created some tests. Uh, software suites. Is there any other tools that you use when you're developing those things? Um, well, you know, or creating or dumping firmware or what have you. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I've had to, I've had to use a JTAG. I've had to use a, a JTAG is basically dead on Android, but I've used JTAG extract firmware before. I've used a flash memory readers to extract firmware. Okay. Um, if you got root on the device, you can obviously dump the firmware. You ever do you solder chips and, and rid them that yeah, way? Flash memory. Yes. Oh, flash. Okay. All right. Very cool. So, all right. Well, that was an excellent talk. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that will be the, uh, you know, the best talk of the day. Cause, uh, I hope it was. I hope there's something better. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm loving the caliber of talks today. So, um, yeah. Um, thank you uh, for coming awesome. to the show, and thank you for right. talking with us. Right, right on. That was uh, at J Case, right? Right. And then the other gentleman who helped you with uh, some of it was... There's, um, well, Sean Beaupre, which is at Firewater Devs, Okay. Um, did most of it. Okay. Um, ben Atkins, which is at Ben underscore RA, helped with some of it, too. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Sean's, Sean's incredible. Awesome. Firewater Dev guy. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So we're here at B-Side Seattle with...
Sam Vaughn. Okay, and you are on Twitter as? Sidechannel underscore org, okay. or also known as Subterfuge. Subterfuge, okay. So, um, is the, so you're, you organized the Crypto Village here at B-Side Seattle. That's correct. This is our second year. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, how this kind of came about, um, I've always been interested in puzzles, lockpicking, and all that, and uh, Josh who runs B-Sides, has always had a lockpick village. So I was kind of like, hey, I, okay. I want to contribute. I'd like to be part of this. And so uh, I don't remember exactly how it came up, but we decided we wanted to do a crypto challenge for this. And that's kind of the what started this. And so I worked uh, for a few months coming up with diff- different ideas around puzzles and ended up on one. But I, I thought with that, it would be really cool to have a village along with this or like an area so people could get an introduction to classic cryptography puzzles all the way up to some of the more advanced um, cryptos and, and puzzle ideas. Okay. And that's kind of the, how that started. Um, I learned a lot from last year, uh, I, both on the puzzle and on how to, to run this type of thing. So I've made a, some slight improvements this time around. Did you, uh, did you make it too easy last year? Or too la- easy? Actually, last year I made it too hard. Oh, uh, so oh, okay. I, I, okay. It, the, the classic problem that you always assume everyone's at your level and so I made, so I made a, uh, what I thought was a decent challenge last year. And so I dialed it down a little bit and did some visionaire ciphers and some more classic, but I completely ignored basic substitution ciphers. And I started to get uh, people interested from the Lockpick Village, kids, uh, uh, all the way up to adults, but they had no idea what crypto was. And so I was spending a lot of time trying to ramp them up. And so this year I tried to have a real intro level so people can just start dive right in and have some fun with that and then try to make it a progression so you have a level one level two all the way up into some of the more custom stuff where you can start winning prizes such as books and other things right on see i i think you gave me a little charity because i only got three of like the level ones or something no actually no so those books are for people who solve those and so my my goal is to people that are interested you stay and you solve those you're going to get a couple intro to crypto books because you, you you have an interest uh, uh, and that was that was the key for there. Some of the, the more ch- larger puzzle, you know, larger prizes was if you solve the, the main puzzle. So like last year, um, I was introduced to a book called The Maze of Games, and so I put a hard copy up for whoever solved the main puzzle from last year. Did it get solved? About six months later. Six, six it, months later. Yeah, it was three people, uh, I think over in Europe, it had solved it. And so I had met with them down at DEF CON given, and given the book so they could actually have it. Okay. So so for, for the level one, since the people who are listening to this didn't go necessarily to these sides, right. what, what kind of ciphers do you put in a level one cipher challenge? Basic substitution. So if anyone's ever played like a cryptogram, which is basically A equals B. So if you shift the alphabet by three letters uh-huh. uh, or down like the Caesar cipher where you shift it by 13, those. Uh, for the next two ones that I did, I actually did the straight substitution, but just scrambled. The, it wasn't a shift. It was a scramble of the alphabet, okay. which was a random key. Yeah. Uh, so, But it was completely susceptible to frequency analysis. And so you should just be able to brute force it over a period of either 10 minutes to a couple hours, depending on the message. So if there's 10 U's, it might be a, a vowel. or um, Also, it would be like uh, not just a frequency analysis, but like if you know most words have a, a consonant and a vowel, or there's two letters together, they mean like an SS or an NN or something like that, right? Absolutely, yeah. So you see two together, it's like a TT, SS. Yeah. And if you've got a single letter, and the other thing that I did for the intro is I kept the spacing of the sentence. Yeah, all that. so that that really helps out. Typical, so like when you go to level two, uh, we'll do what what they'll do is they normally erase the spacing and then group them into fives to make it more confusing. Okay. Th- those are just as susceptible to brute force, but when you're working on them with pen and paper, it becomes a little bit harder because you're like, this doesn't look like a word, but yeah. so. Um, that's the kind of stuff I started putting into the entry level, and that's that goes along with the books too. So that somebody can take it home, read about it, maybe go look online and try to solve from there. So if somebody was interested in doing this outside of a B sides or a con, what would what would be some of the references or resources you would look at? I would start with David Kahn's The Code Breakers. It's it's a real famous book that he wrote about the history of crypto, uh, cryptography. Um, uh, Simon Singh's uh, book. Uh, I think of also the same title. Um, yeah, those those books would be a really really good start, and you can Wikipedia. They, Wikipedia. They've got yeah, they've got a ton a ton of stuff. That's how we yeah, started. Yeah. I was telling you about the the CTF we did yeah. last year for DerbyCon. I 
just basically looked up, you know, Playfair ciphers from the Wikipedia, and, and that was one of the stages in our in our uh, yep. system. I had to give people a clue because I wanted to kind of make it somewhat easy to, to figure out. But. Right, and that's the hard part. It's like when doing these puzzles, I know the rabbit hole I went down. Yeah. And so like when I did the one last year, so how do I create hints to get people to the right rabbit hole to go down? Right. And that was the fun part for me. I spent a lot of time laboring over just the hints and testing them out on, on different friends to say, hey, what, what do you think when you see this? And they'd be like this. I'm like, oh, darn it. i got to go back and, and, and adjust it. Um, the other bit that I wanted to do, there's a lot of online solvers now. Oh, yeah. And so I wanted the puzzles to be resistant to online solvers. So I, I tested like anything I could get my hands on. I was throwing my, my, my puzzles and stuff at to make sure that the, that didn't give an unfair advantage to somebody actually wanting to use pen and paper versus somebody just that, that typed into Google, found one, and, and solved it that way. Cool. Yeah, I've yeah. seen a lot of CTS where that's happened, where like the, the, the entry level uh, uh, crypto ones, uh, somebody solves real quick because they're just using online solvers. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I actually was hoping that somebody would figure out it was a Playfair cipher and then go to Google and try to find one yes. that would help them solve it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I always picked the one that wasn't the very top one, which is what they would pick. And sometimes <laughs> the algorithms or the coding or the yeah. programming would be wrong. Yeah. And they would get the wrong answer. Yep. You know, so there's, there's, I think there's some improper implementations of the ciphers online too. I think it's, it, it, yeah, especially like the one like Enigma. There were several Enigma solvers yeah. out there, but they all solved it differently, or they yeah. all used one uh, one uh, key ring or, or whatever to, to yeah to one solve. rotor versus one rotor instead versus of the three, three yeah whatever. yeah and that caused a lot of problems because they were like this doesn't make any sense and I'm like yeah. well I use this link you know so yeah it was uh, it was kind of kind of difficult but yeah so um are there any other places to do crypto villages other than here. Well, I want to give a shout out to, there is a crypto and privacy village that happens at DEF CON. It's a completely okay. separate group. They, they deal more in actual real world cryptography. Uh, if you're talking um, uh, uh, public key cryptography uh, and, and those type of talks along with privacy. Sure. So those are the only ones I've ever seen. I've not ever seen one that's, that's geared more towards puzzles and uh, basic class cryptography. Probably the closest thing is like Lost at DEF CON. He's, he throws a lot of the stuff into his challenges. Right. Uh, but I was trying to get something that could be solvable in a day or something you could take with you and work on for next couple of weeks or month at your leisure sure. and then have some reward of solving that and, yeah. and trying to entice people into this type of puzzle making. Okay. Um, so are you available for other cons? Yes. Okay. And uh, tell me, you said uh, side channel underscore dot, uh, underscore org on Twitter. Correct. And if you if you search for subterfuge, uh, there's okay. only a few of those, but I'm subterfuge at side channel underscore org and what on is, Twitter. And what is side channel? Uh, side channel is just one of the domains I own. Oh, that, okay. that's, that's And side channel attacks has always been something I'm, I'm always been interested in. Uh, and that's just like, a, it's a crypto type attack that sure. you, uh, the, at the most basic level, you're looking at power levels on chips to, to derive keys. Um, wow. All yeah. Right. So it, it's it, so a lot of times when you're designing crypto systems, you have to make sure they're resistant to these type of timing attacks. I always just <laughs> okay. love that idea of coming from a side door. Yes, uh, I think yeah. what was it? Uh, uh, Bruce Schneier had was famously quoted about side channel attacks. It's like instead of hitting it head on, like if you've got some sort of power, you just like, well, what happens if I hit it like 30 times? You know, what does it do? You try to break things not in the in the head on approach. Yeah. And so I just always love that. And so when the domain came open, I took it and. And that's probably another hint if you're ever trying to sell some of my my puzzles. Subterfuge is something I might throw in there. To... So bang, bang it a couple times with a hammer. And yeah, then... yeah. Or look at it from side, a different angle. Right on. All right. Well, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Excellent. All right. So we are here at B sides again with Matt Domko. Domka. Domko. Domko. Yeah. And you are on Twitter as... Hashtag cyber. Hashtag cyber. That's not what the actual hashtag no, is. No, that's just like at H-A-S-H. Yes. It's, yeah. I figure like you just throw like cyber in front of anything and you get money. So I was like, maybe I can make that my Twitter handle and just start getting money. Damn. It's like... Cyber it's breaking down security cybercast. Yeah. Cyber. The cyber... Five more times, five times. Cyber, cyber. Much more income. It's like Beetlejuice. You both say it three times, the money's come. Yeah. <laughs> So you flew up here from Hot Lamb. Yes. It's, it's not hot right now. No, it, well, it's beautiful. So I used to live up here for like eight years. Yeah. Now that I'm down in Georgia, I can ride my bike to work. 
360 days a year. 360? 360. There are five days when it's too cold and 60 miles an hour. Oh, I'm not doing it. Or it has half inch ice. Yeah, or there's ice. It's ice, yeah. half inch ice. Or like again. a tornado. Yeah. But yeah. that's five days a year. So right on. Bad. All right. So you came up here just for this. Yeah. Why? Uh, so I got, I've got friends that live here still, so I got okay. to spend a couple days, and my company said, hey, if you go stand on stage and look pretty in your Chiron shirt, uh, we'll pay for your flight. Did, did you give a talk? Or yeah. On what? Uh, bro. So I wrote a bro script to do uh, anomalous uh, detection, basically. Uh-huh. Uh, makes building your baselines a lot easier. Right so uh, kind of just try to expose more people to it, try okay. to make... Life easier for blue teamers. And you use Bro at your office quite a bit. Though. Yeah, yeah. And on what 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 makes it better than say uh, Snort or Circata or, or something like that? So I love it for the small amount of log sizes, right? Okay. So with with Snort and with uh, Circata, anything where you're gathering full PCAP, like you can keep full PCAP for a week, maybe yeah. if you're lucky. I can keep Bro logs, the package string. I can keep that for six months, a year. Like okay. life becomes really good, uh, and then. With those, so Snort and Circata, they're both signature-based. So if you don't have a signature, it's useless. Sure. Uh, the guys that have been working on the Bro project, like, you can do anything with it, and it works. Uh, yeah. That's why I love it. So we, we just talked about this, uh, uh, Yara rules and all those. So um, how, do you, how does your company go about finding and curating uh, threat lists or your Yara rule sets or whatever? Uh, you make so, your own? So I'm an instructor. I don't, yeah, so I don't do our actual security. We've got a bunch of cool guys that do that. Okay. And they don't let me play with their stuff because then I want to try cool new things that I want to teach, uh, and then I sucks. get in trouble. So okay. I don't do get you, to do the cool stuff. Yeah. Okay, so when you're teaching, what exactly do you teach them? So I'm teaching them how the different uh, the different tools work. Yeah. So getting them exposed to them for a first time. Okay. So, uh, and then if you've seen it once, well, now we're going to drive you a little bit harder. Now you can maybe think about things you hadn't thought before. Okay. So uh, we target mostly uh, people that have, so you've already got your security plus and you've got a couple of years in the industry, mm-hmm. but uh, you want to do more than just process tickets yeah. in a sock somewhere. Uh, we can expose you to some new things and that's oh, nice. what we do. Okay. So, so you, you said, you know, you can store full PCAP for you know, months at a time or whatever. You like bro because of the small, the small file sizes. Is there, is it necessary to capture full PCAP? Or, and, and, or if it's not, what, what fields are necessary or most important for that kind of stuff? So I love having all three, right? So whenever I, I did the talk, I kind of hit on. So you can do 100% PCAP. You don't have, that takes up a lot of space. So I can keep that for a couple weeks if I can. As long as I can, it's important. Yeah. Uh, if Once that starts to go away, I have to roll it over. I definitely want to have my package string. So anything that's ASCII text or can be converted into ASCII text, I want that for as long as possible. Okay. And then on the far right... For a couple years, if I can, I would still like NetFlow data. So going from just a couple weeks, because that's all I can store as far as PCAP goes, a couple months or as much as I can store mm-hmm. as far as packet string goes, and then with NetFlow, as long as I can store because it's just tiny text files. Packet string so that you can run grab or you can look for you know, probably malware with comments? Or... Well, so the cool thing about packet string and the stuff, the, the logs that Bro provides us, uh, so if... I know that there was an intrusion, and I know that system A downloaded a malicious binary. And I have the name of the binary because it was running, and I found it. Uh, If I don't have PCAP anymore, I don't really know, if all I have is PCAP, I don't really know where that file came from. But if I'm storing packet string, I'll actually see the get request where that system downloaded the malicious binary. So now I have another IP I can track. Uh, It just gives me a lot more flexibility. Okay. Uh, and so you've got all this data. How long does it take to analyze things? Um, so it it definitely takes time if you do it the old way. I know whenever I first uh, started trying to like build my little baselines, and that's that's what the talk was basically about. But when I first started, it was let me just pull up the PCAP and sort, and now I'm manually going through and making a list. And it takes forever, like weeks, just for like 100 hosts. So if we bring Bro into the equation... I can have Bro just log, hey, create a list of every single port that this host used. And now I have a list of every single port that this host used. And it's that easy. It takes like five minutes. 
So Bro does analysis. Of, what does it use to store on the back end? Are we talking like a Postgres database or MongoDB or whatever? What no, it so they're actually all just stored in uh, flat text files. They get archived. Really? Yeah, so they get, it's, they're tiny. It's not, uh, it's not a super big deal. They're tiny. They get, uh, they're tab separated. It's just right there. Uh, as far as access them, if they get rolled over, well, now they're, they're zipped up, but they're still text files. Uh, I love Security Onion just because I've uh, got an Augusta guy that, that wrote it, so yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, so with that, all of my bro data automatically goes into Elsa, and okay. so that does get stored in a database, and then Elsa is where I do the majority of the querying. Okay. So, so you said the text files are tab, tab separated values? Yeah. Okay, so you can use the ultimate InfoSec tool, Excel. Yes, and exactly. Them into Excel. Yep. So you can and have just do your filters. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's. I joke, but I I use Excel. I use Excel probably once or twice a day. Oh, to do anything, whether it be firewall audits or whatever, <laughs> it sucks. So, um, so you're an instructor uh, just for your own company? Right? Oh no, I work for Chiron Technology Services. Oh, uh, okay. There's. So I think you're there's teaching about... other companies how to use Pro properly. Correct. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say properly. <laughs> My definition and Seth and the rest of the guys that work on the project, it might vary, but I'm yeah. trying to get the word out about it, at least. Okay. So. All right. So um, so what, where, where are you going after here? What are you speaking at? Uh, I'm actually going home for a couple weeks. I think I'll be teaching in Augusta and then uh, going to Germany for Troopers DE. That, that's going to be amazing. What is that? Uh, it's, it's like Europe's black hat almost. Is it the uh, run by the ERNW yeah, folks? Yeah, it's run by ERNW. Okay, yeah. yeah, Paul Coggin told me about those folks. They're really doing some next level shit. Yeah, I I can't believe they accepted me. I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, Don't talk like no, that. No, I submitted That's for it. Twitter talk. I was just like, well, you know, they can say no if they want to, and I'll be totally okay with it. And then they email me, and I was just like... You sure you're not the token American? Anymore? That's what I was thinking, but no. Uh, <laughs> who is it that's going... Uh, is it... I can't remember who the other guy is going, but it's like some, like, InfoSec rock star is also going, and he's going to be talking about some cool tool, and I'm just like, I'm going to be on the same stage as him. That's, that's going to be right. awesome. I got people calling me celebrity here, and I told them to just go F themselves right off, because <laughs> I'm like, I ain't nothing. So what are, you ta- what are you talking about over there, Troopers? Are you talking uh, about the same thing? So I actually took uh, the concepts that I, that I talk, spoke about here. Uh-huh. I took them, and I was like, you know, this could still be easier. So what I'm doing is, is I'm writing a Python script that'll just basically automate all that. My goal is, because I was in the Army, and I know I wasn't the smartest guy in the world, so I want to be able to have a tool that I can just hand out to some dude in the Army, and he can click option three, and now he's got a sensor deployed. And when he clicks option four, it'll automatically build that baseline for him. So it'll look at all the alerts, parse them, and then once the initial one's built, he'll still get alerts, and he can just go through a, a menu, yes, no, is this traffic authorized? Yes. Is this traffic authorized? No. And uh, just trying to make things easier for the, like the, the smaller security teams. Yeah. I think it's the name of the talk. It's like arming small security teams. Okay. So let me ask you a question. So you, you're going to create a Python script, but um, do you worry that there would be an over reliance on your tool to the point where they would just assume that everything is good on your tool instead of trying to actually learn the commands needed to, you know, actually secure their own environment? Uh, I mean, it's great to have a script, right? But if you don't know the command that's you know actually doing what's under the hood, it kind of is a detriment, is it not? Right. No, it definitely it it would be bad. I've I've got a couple warnings on there that's like you should not do this, but it'll work. Okay. But uh, you're definitely right. I I really don't want somebody just going to GitHub pulling it down and being like, yeah, we have uh, anomaly based logging IDS now, mission uh, complete. Like yeah. I don't I don't want that. Because if they're just running the script, they may not be doing the necessary after bits to, right. to do what's necessary. So they may have anomalies, they just don't know what they got. Right, exactly. Okay. So uh, definitely not telling people, this is amazing and it'll solve all your problems, but it'll make your life a little bit easier yeah. if you want it. I've always been a fan of, like, uh, I use Handbrake. So okay. when you're burning videos or shaking down videos, it'll show you the options at the bottom right. along with the command that you're running, which I always thought was great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of like that kind of user interface. I wish there was more like that. I, I know that not everybody cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show. No problem. Appreciate Thanks that. And um, if you ever, you do a lot of PCAP analysis yeah. on the reg. So, you know, can we, could count on you for another episode maybe to talk about PCAP analysis? Oh, definitely. Excellent. 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 All right. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Right on.